Sunday evening, live stories on livestoriesworldwide.com. We just thank you for joining us tonight and uh, remind you, don't just sit there and enjoy it yourself, but pass this on to your friends, to your neighbors, to your family. Tell them about this wonderful uh, life stories. It is going to be on here tonight. Pass it on to as many people as you can. And let me remind anyone, if you need help, if you need prayer, then please contact us on our hotline, which is 07943 Or if you're outside the UK, then plus 44 in front of that number. You can phone, you can WhatsApp, you can text. And someone will get back to you as soon as possible. You can also contact us on our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. And if you go on there, you will find lots of information about the programs that we're, that we're doing regularly. But tonight, uh, we have a guest speaker originally from South Africa, uh, Ruth O'Reilly Smith, who was originally uh, working in radio in South Africa and teaching there. But then came to the UK and continued with uh, radio and is working with UCB, which is United Christian Broadcasters. She hosts a program, UCB2. This is my story. And uh, tonight, she's going to share her story with you. So right now, I'm going to hand over to Ruth to tell her story. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. Uh, you know, usually on radio, we're always told to speak to the one. Um, and I've found it a, a really helpful tool. I found it a helpful tool with, with regards to whoever, whomever I'm speaking to. Um, so wherever you are tonight, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is a, a huge honor for me. I had Alan on my show recently to tell his story. So he set the bar high. <laughs> um, I, as, as Alan mentioned, I grew up in South Africa. I'm the oldest of five children. And so the household was uh, pretty full on. As, as the eldest, I had to uh, take care of the younger siblings. There's 10 years between me and my youngest brother. There's three girls and two boys. Um, and we grew up in a household of faith. We grew up in a household with parents who were filled with the Holy Spirit, um, the first in their generation. So they grew up both with an awareness of God in South Africa. We were very aware of God. And, um, but, it, but my parents grew up in a church or they were part of a church, a Bible-believing church, where the minister really studied God's word and in the Bible um, read about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is the now. And so it was just an amazing family to be born into and a church to be a part of. Uh, South Africa has a great legacy of incredible Bible uh, churches and Holy Spirit churches, really big churches. So the church I was part of was massive. At one stage, I think at the biggest, it was over 5,000 people. And my parents were there from really the inception. So I grew up in this household of faith, uh, but my parents were kind of just nav trying to navigate their way in this new relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, reading God's word in the morning. I remember them waking up really early, uh, five o'clock in the morning, they would wake up uh, with a cup of coffee and have time alone with God first, mom and dad, and then time together. Um, praying for us and for our whole family. I remember that from a young girl. Um, so I grew up loving Jesus. I grew up aware of Jesus. I grew up going to Bible clubs and learning Bible verses. Uh, I remember I was, I was quite competitive at the time and wanted to make sure that I was, um, you know, learning the Bible verses that I needed to remember for the next week. And so as much as I grew up in this household of faith um, and grew up knowing that the Bible was really important, the astonishing thing is that I never read the Bible from cover to cover until very recently. And so even though I've been on Christian radio, I've been with Christian media um, since 1995, I got into radio. It's only really probably in the last five or six years 
that I've actually been initially, I, it was part of a job that I needed to do, and I'll get, I'll get to that in just a bit. But I had to read through the whole Bible. And it was only then that I really discovered the treasure of God speaking to me through his word and the power of the word of God through his word, through the Bible to begin to change me. And there was a lot of changing that needed to be doing, um, needed to be done. I didn't realize that. Uh, I thought, you know, as, as a lot of humanity thinks, that I was okay. Um, I mean, I grew up in this loving, very loving family, uh, but there was a deep rebellion that ran in me and an arrogance and a pride. And you know what I love about God is that he, he knows our hearts. And I was thinking this week a little bit about my story uh, as I thought about coming and joining you and sharing some of my story. And I thought, if I had to think about my life, um, you know, which Bible character could I, could I think of? Um, what would my story be most like? And I think there are lots of characters at different stages and ages of my life. But um, for a lot of my life, I was probably a bit of a Jacob figure of wrestling with God, loving God, but wrestling with God and kind of sitting on the fence for a lot of my walk with Jesus. And so as much as I love God, I had this rebelliousness in me. And I guess it kind of really came down to uh, a desire to please people and a desire to get noticed. Maybe it came from just growing up in a really big family that I somehow had to do something that would get me noticed. Um, at home, I was a very good girl, very compliant child. Uh, at church and at youth group, I was a very good girl. Uh, I was a youth leader, but at the core of me, I knew I was wrestling with a rebellious spirit. And so at school, I would try and fit in and I, I would swear and, you know, just, I don't know, do a whole, I wasn't, if you consider it now, I wouldn't consider it particularly bad, but I know that in my heart, I was rebelling against God. And I remember the one day I was about 13 and I was on my way to my piano lesson. School had finished and so there weren't too many children about. And I was walking down the corridor of school in South Africa. I would have been in my second year of senior school, second year of, of high school. And I remember hearing the voice of God. Now, I don't know that it was an audible voice of God, but I distinctly remember it was a moment that impacted me for, for the rest of my life because I sensed that God was saying to me, choose this day who you will serve, me or the enemy of your soul. And in that moment, in that instant, I chose to serve God. And so that was a really key time for me. If I go back, I remember giving my life to Jesus at the age of five. So I remember having, we had a, an outdoor uh, service. I think our church was building, doing a building project. And for whatever reason, at this particular occasion, we had a service outside and I remember it raining. And I remember going forward to give my heart to Jesus. And I was about five years old. It's very young. So I love Jesus. And then again, uh, at the age of about 13 or 14, gave my life to Jesus. And it was at that point, a really key point in my walk with Christ is that I, I genuinely had a surrender moment and God helped me to change the narrative that was in my head, which was filled with swear words, <laughs> bad language, and just a desire to listen to secular music. I, I remember I went through this phase of just wanting to get rid of all of that and wanting to fill my heart. I had this sense. It was almost as if the Holy Spirit had 
um, started teaching me even then when I surrendered my will to replace the negative narrative and the, the bad language with positive affirmations and good words and uh, Christian music. And so I remember buying Amy Grant, uh, Need Me On. It was my first album, a record <laughs> um, that, I, that I used to play. And I think I had Pharrell and Pharrell or whatever, going back to the 1990s, 1980s. Um, but I, I, again, if I just go back a bit, I was filled with the Holy Spirit on a camp. Uh, and I always put that down to a really key moment in my life as well as the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the life of a Christian requires us to surrender to God. And so even though I had given my life to Jesus, I'd asked Jesus to come into my life and I believe my spirit was alive, uh, my flesh was very weak and it took a long time and many years uh, and many moments of surrender in my life to truly come to a place where I realized that I can't live with one foot in the world and one foot serving God. I can't live half-heartedly, that I was living a lukewarm life. Uh, and then on this Christmas, Christian camp, when I was a bit older, probably also around 14, 15, uh, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and I just, and I remember that it was the Holy Spirit and it has been the Holy Spirit who has uh, led me and, and changed me. And what I, and I, I think another character I would like to compare myself with is a bit of a David figure in the sense that I know that God knows my heart. And so in spite of, you know, now looking back, I see the rebelliousness of, in my heart and that rebellious streak. I just love God's grace and it's his kindness that leads us to a place of repentance. And he's so patient with us. And I'm so grateful for that, that God is so patient and has been so patient with me. And so it's almost as if if I, if I look back, I see this wooing that's gone on. God has wooed me. He's, he's my beloved. And so over the years, it's almost like he's really, God gives you what you need. And it's almost as if throughout my life, I was testing God to see, will he really remain faithful to me if I am faithless? Will he pursue me with his love? Will he woo me if I deny him? If I, if I am rebellious, will he give up on me? And the answer, as I have learned over many, many years, is no. Never. He pursues me. He loves me. He woos me. And the amazing thing is that when God does that over the years and through many different circumstances, is that it begins to soften your heart. That's what love does, is it begins to soften your heart. When you realize that you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything that will keep you from the love of God. It truly is as far as the east is from the west, as high as the heavens are above. And I've come to learn that over the years, and I'm just so grateful. Um, I felt the call of God to, um, over the years, I just felt, I felt the Holy Spirit just leading me to do different things. So, you know, I, I, I had these really immature young prayers. Uh, first, as that Christian who decided to get off the fence and actually serve Christ, I became involved in a student Christian association um, at school. And I was part of, I was really bold in my faith. I kind of went from quite literally, I'm a, I am a bit of a, you know, al although I've, I was a bit of a lukewarm Christian for a long time, I am a black and white 
girl, you know, I'm an all or nothing kind of person. And so I literally went from being a certain kind of person to being something completely different. The Holy Spirit really transformed me and helped me to live differently. And I was very bold for Christ. Um, and yet there was still something in me that kind of wanted a little bit of that other life. I hadn't let it go completely. And so I found myself in situations where over the years, I would be bold in my faith on the one hand, declaring the love of Jesus, telling people about Christ um, and how they need to follow Jesus because you have this abundant life, this amazing love of God as our Heavenly Father. And yet, not quite living that life a little like uh james in the bible who talks about you know you you speak you talk a good talk but where is the life of the christian you know where where does that show up um so yeah i kind of saw that if i look back now you can see that quite plainly in my life i remember um there were times when i was in london and i was uh, I was working for a Christian radio station. I was working for a Christian broadcaster. And I was partying on the weekend down in London uh, in the clubs and telling people about Christ, <laughs> whopping and, you know, raving and, and telling people about the love of Jesus. It was just, you know, it's bonkers. And I remember um, somebody saying to me, but, but you're a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how can you be telling me about God when, you know, look at what you're doing? So it's quite obvious from people from the outside, you know, the kind of double standards and the kind of double life uh, almost that I was living. Anyway, um, I, I got married. Um, I'll, let me go back quickly to just the, the I just felt that, um when it comes to radio, let me just touch on that quickly. So I, I've always loved radio. I've always loved listening to radio. Uh, I remember lying in bed and having, I loved having the shortwave radio on. And I would love nothing than, better than going through the dials and trying to find a voice that I could recognize. And I would find a voice like, someone speaking from London. This is the BBC coming to you live from London. And I was just enamored by this voice. It was mysterious. It was wonderful. I was this kid in Africa, you know, listening to voices from all over the world. And it was just something so magical. But I had no idea that this is actually something that I could do and get paid for do for a living? <laughs> I had no idea. It was just something I loved. And so I always, I loved voices on radio. And uh, after school, I had no idea what to do. But my father, who's so wise, I remember him saying, you know, your life is a little like a ship. And in Christ, it, you've got the rudder that's pointed in the right direction. And you just need to step out in faith. So apply to uni and just see where God leads you. And so I did that. So I got into uni and just did a BA education. Thought I'll, I'll get into teaching. I come from a long line of teachers. I have a legacy of teachers and uh, lecturers in my family. So I thought it was a safe bet. And studied English and geography. <clears throat> At, uh, at uni, and it was in my second year of university that uh, a friend of mine said that he'd seen an advert for English DJs. I went to an Afrikaans university, and so I decided to have a go because uh, as part of my holiday job, I was given the the position of working for in a store a little bit like your MS type store during the PA the public announcements so ladies and gentlemen uh, in your homeware department we have whatever 50% discount and so that would be me 
And so this friend of mine said he'd heard about this. So I, I go for my um, little test and they asked me about my favorite artist. And I said, uh, um, it's that guy who sings um, something about tears and heaven. <laughs> so I knew who sang what. I knew who's the artist. But, uh, and I knew the songs, but I didn't know who sang what. But anyway, they, they thought I had a pretty good voice. And so I got the job. So I got onto radio uh, at university. And that kind of was it for me. I just loved it. Um, and then at the, the church I was going to started a community radio station. And so because I had all of this, I don't know, five months of experience at university radio, they asked me to come on board as a presenter um, at this Christian radio, uh, community radio in South Africa in 1995. And I, of course, said yes. So while I was studying, studying, um, I was doing a show and I would do my classes and then I would go and host the afternoon drive or do the breakfast show and come on and do my um my classes so I just love that absolutely love radio and what I've seen with radio is that God has brought transformation in my life through the interviews that I've had God has spoken to me through the conversations that I have had the amazing thing about Christian radio and I've often thought about maybe going into mainstream radio um, and I have considered doing other media not against it at all but it's almost as, as if God knew that my true transformation was going to come from speaking his word day in and day out as part of my job because part of my role as a radio announcer on a Christian radio station is that I have to speak life that comes from the truth that we find in the Bible every day uh, you know, it doesn't matter how, much, how I feel. It doesn't matter what kind of day I'm having. It doesn't matter how rebellious my heart is at certain points of the, my life. My job is to get on the radio every day and speak life and encourage the listener. And so often what I've found, especially when I was in, a, in not a good place, um, is that by the end of the program, I would feel better. Even though I, you know, circumstances may have still been exactly the same and I would still need to go and, you know, sort things out. Something in me had shifted. And so I recognized that God was using this platform through his spirit to begin to change me, to, again, to soften my heart, to woo me. Uh, you know, on the days when I was struggling to just let the music, the Christian music, feed my soul. The Bible verses, the word for today, the testimonies, um, all of that has brought transformation. God is just so kind and I'm just so grateful. But I really wanted to travel. So I'd heard these voices from far across the lands. <laughs> I wanted to go and see them. I love South Africa, absolutely love South Africa. It was never my intention to leave. But I wanted to go and travel. And so, you know, we didn't come from a family with a lot of money. I had no idea how that was going to happen, but I was determined. And there's a lot to say for determination and perseverance. And so God just made a way um, through friends and uh, just a, amazing his favor he made a way for me to be able to travel to the UK. And I got a two year working holiday visa, um, traveled to the UK in 1999. And then after a few months, I started working with a Christian radio station that was based in West Bromwich broadcasting. It was extraordinary, actually. I mean, if, <laughs> you know, I applied to the BBC when I arrived and for some bizarre reason, they didn't take me up. Just couldn't fathom why, but uh, it might have had something to do with my very strong South African accent when I first arrived. Um, aside from 
probably a whole lot of other things. But anyway, um, I just love God in his providence, how within months, uh, probably after about six months of living in London, I got in touch with a friend who I had co-hosted a program with in South Africa. And him, uh, him and his family had emigrated to England. And he was involved with this Christian broadcaster broadcasting back to Africa on shortwave and on FM in Uganda, in Nigeria, in Zambia. Um, and so it was just amazing. If I look back, I'm just in awe of God, you know, that it was, I fell in love with radio through shortwave. And here God was using me in England. I mean, if I had searched for a radio station like this, I don't think I would have found it. But God just led me providentially to this radio station. And so I started working in the news department, broadcasting uh, back to Central and Southern Africa on shortwave and on FM on those specific, in those specific countries. Uh, and then on Saturdays, hosting a youth program uh, to the, these these countries and I did that for about five years um, the radio station wanted to hold on to me and so I got my work permit and I just stayed and then through friends and the church I was involved with I met my now husband who's a Brahmi and we got married in 2003 there we go <laughs> I remember that um, and uh, yeah all this time I was working for this Christian radio station and then they moved to Africa and started broadcasting from Cape Town and um, which made sense they were broadcasting then from Africa to Africa but it meant that I lost my job so I was made redundant and I tried to find another job in radio um, in the news department and it just wasn't happening so I ended up having to get a job and I worked in teaching then briefly I did supply teaching in Birmingham for some inner city Birmingham schools that was very humbling I, I, I just see how God has led me on these this journey of uh, humbling me so you know in order to get me to surrender my will and obey he has loved me he has wooed me but there have been times where he's allowed me to be humbled and that was on one occasion um, you know I was a very well respected presenter and, and newsreader and now I was in a classroom and I was really out of my comfort zone I had no idea what I was doing I was given a job but I didn't know what I was doing. And so I had to throw myself on the mercy of God every single day. And these kids were like nothing I'd met before. <laughs> so I remember getting to school earlier and earlier and earlier so that I would have time to pray over every single chair in that class, go through every single lesson. And cry to God quite literally with tears streaming down my eyes for help to teach these children and that God would help me to have control in the class and not make a fool of myself which I did on numerous occasions um, but somehow in those 10 months or so God taught me some amazing things about him again about children about humanity about life uh, it's a very very humbling journey but he also taught me how to communicate better uh, how to really be a lot sharper and more effective in my communication and a lot more engaging so I count that time as so precious because I had sent my CV to a number of different radio stations with zero results uh, and I'd kept the one for UCB back I just felt I sensed again that um, 
God said I need to hold on to this one. I had my CV and my demo in an envelope with the address for United Christian Broadcasters on. And I think there was probably a, a stamp on there as well. It was ready to go. And I just felt I needed to hold on to it. So I was in the middle of teaching um, and kind of trying to, try to muddle my way through, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, God really helped me. And I did learn to love those kids so much. I really love those children and I prayed for them and I saw God move in their lives. And I saw God move in me and in the teachers that I was working with. I, I started to enjoy it. And I love how when we begin to surrender to God and we stop fighting him and we begin to see such beautiful things happen in our lives. And so at around about December time, I, I just sensed that God said, send it now. So I posted the, uh, the CV and the demo to United Christian Broadcasters. And it wasn't long after that I heard, I had an email from the then manager saying, we've got a position available and we'd like you to go for it. So I applied and I was shortlisted and invited for an interview. And at the time, the interview process included a part of the interview where we were given a subject, a topic, and we were given a couple of minutes to prepare and we had to do an impromptu speech in front of all of the radio staff at the time. And because of my 10 months of very scary humbling experience in front of children where you've got to think on your feet. This is secondary school children. I was teaching from year seven to year 12, I think year 11. Um, I, I had learned over those last 10 months how to react, how to respond uh, instantly. And so I just, it was easy for me. It was almost as if the Lord had prepared me for this moment. Bring it on, Jesus. And so I, uh, I was able to talk really passionately and confidently. And basically, they offered me the job on the day, which was amazing. And so I started at United Christian Broadcasters um, Broadcasting. I think it was an evening program. That was back in 2006. And so I was full time with them. And I was traveling from Birmingham to Stoke-on-Trent. And at the time, they were doing roadworks. Again, um, more roadworks. And I, I, I remember my husband at one stage just saying, look, this is ridiculous. You know, sometimes it would take two, three hours for me to get home or to work. So it was silly. And so... We decided to have a look in Stoke-on-Trent and we found a place, so we moved to Stoke. And it wasn't long after that that I discovered I was pregnant. And so I was pregnant with twins. And our twins were born in Stoke-on-Trent in 2007. Um, and so we, we, uh, we were enjoying them and I was on maternity leave. Um, and so I've worked with UCB full-time, part-time and then during the recession my husband works in construction and he lost his job a couple of times and then he was offered a position in Dubai and this is where um, again God's word has just spoken so deeply to me you know a lot of people ask about how how do you hear God speak to you um, and I've got a new book out called God Speaks, 40 Letters from the Father's Heart. And, and a big question that people are asking me is, but, you know, can everybody hear God speak? And I would say one of the greatest ways that God speaks to us is through his word. But I've really only discovered that recently, sadly, um, through his word and through his Holy Spirit revealing the truth and the wonder of God's word to us. And I remember God showing me, because, I mean, that's a big move, you know, for us to, to up sticks. My, my husband offered this 
um, was offered this position in Dubai. And although it sounded really exciting, it was a big thing for us to leave everything we had in England. You know, we'd built up, I'd lived in England then for 10 years. Um, but I read the story of the Shunammite woman. God led me to that beautiful story where Elisha the prophet goes to her and says, there's going to be a famine in the land and you need to leave. Uh, and, and, you know, God will bring you back at some point. And so she was, she left. And I, I think I'm right in saying she was away for, for a number of years. And then she came back. And I just sensed that this was God um, telling us. And so we lived in Dubai for a couple of years. And then we moved to South Africa and we lived there for five years. And so we were out of the country for about seven years when, well, probably around about six years, we sensed that God was calling us back to England. So all of this time I'd lived in, in England for 10 years, but I'd really found it difficult because um, I'd never, it felt as if I had never chosen to live in England. I'd never chosen to make the UK my home. It kind of just happened. Um, and so I'd always missed my family terribly. I'd really hankered back to home in, a, in, a, in quite a bad way. I remember being in tears almost weekly um, on the phone, you know, just far too expensive phone bills. I don't think WhatsApp existed at the time, so I wasn't able to have phone calls via my uh, Wi-Fi. So, uh, you know, my phone bills were just way too expensive because I was missing my family too much. But this time felt different. It felt like God was calling us. And so out of a willingness to follow God, we chose to go. And so my husband got a job back in London and uh, I was tidying things up with the children. They were finishing school. Uh, I quit my job. We sold the car at the airport, um, gave up the, the house we were renting and the children's school places. And I went to check in and I was told that my visa that I had at the time was no longer valid for England. And so at the airport with our eight-year-old children, uh, I had to call my husband and tell him we are not coming over because my visa is no longer valid. And so this was huge for me. Uh, very, very humbling. And uh, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I'd neglected to look at the specifications of this particular visa. And, you know, I, I guess I just become uh, blasé really about traveling because I'd been living in, in England for so long. I've been traveling all over Europe. We'd lived in Dubai and I just had forgotten to look into anything like that. I assumed that um, I would be okay. So the very, very long story short is that it took us 10 months to be able to get a spouse visa, but it was 10 months of us having to live apart from my husband. He was still in, um, in England. It was a bit complicated because his visa for South Africa had expired. So it was just, just the nature of being married to someone of a different nationality. And so I, I was broken. I was completely broken. As a mother, having to... I just felt so bad for my kids who were in tears every night because they missed their dad. My husband was completely distracted. And so the job that he had, he lost because <laughs> he was desperate for his family to come over. And so his um, period of, you know, those first three months in his new job, just didn't go well enough and so he had to get a new job and so for these 10 months we had to live apart and eventually we were reunited and God made a way for us to be together but I came back to England really broken and I remember we were in High Wycombe at the time 
and I was a pretty big mess. But I can just see how the Lord, again, through his beautiful kindness and his amazing grace, started slowly but surely rebuilding my heart. He is close to the brokenhearted. He is near to those who are crushed in spirit. And I felt like I was crushed in spirit. Um, I had lost my spark. And that was really, really sad. But it was out of that brokenness, out of the ashes, that God began to rebuild me and make me new. And that's the promise of the Bible is that God will, he transforms us. He changes us through his Holy Spirit. But that only happens as we hear his voice over our lives, whether it comes through his word, the Bible, or if it comes through what we see in creation, maybe through a song. Um, perhaps it is that still small voice, like I heard when I was 13 years old, Ruth, choose this day who you will serve. That transformation, that change happens when we listen, when we still ourselves and we hear the voice of our maker over our lives. I remember putting the radio on one day. I had UCB on because I was still a presenter. I was doing a freelance um, few shows. I was doing, a, I think, a Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday night, and I was recording it from our, our home, from the bedroom. <laughs> so I was kind of... Uh, before everybody else went into lockdown, I was doing that, recording the show. Uh, I was recording from Dubai, actually, and South Africa. I was doing my program from all over the world. It's amazing. I was still connected to UCB all those years. Um, but I remember switching on the radio and listening in to a song called You're Gonna Be Okay. It's the first time I ever heard it by Jen Johnson. And it just uh, spoke so deeply to me. It was like God was turning up the volume of his voice in my heart and letting me know that I was going to be okay because I didn't think I would be. I thought that, you know, how can I come back from this? And so out of that place, God began to rebuild me. Now, part of what was happening in my life at the time was also that I was writing for our daily bread ministries. I'd been given this amazing opportunity. I, I chose when I was in um, Dubai to do a postgrad in journalism. And part of that, uh, one of the modules was that I had to approach a, um, a publisher to see if they would accept unsolicited work. And so I sent them a few little logs that I'd written or I found something to send them. They kind of like that. So I've been writing for our daily bread ministries as uh, under their our daily journal, our daily journey. That's it. It was called our daily journey. And I wrote for them for probably about three years. But part of this, and this is what I was talking about earlier, where I had to get into the discipline now, it was work for me, of reading through and writing a devotional on two Old Testament books of the Bible and one New Testament book of the Bible. And so through that discipline of having to do that so that I would get paid for these devotionals that I was writing, I began to fall in love with reading God's word. So it went from work and a job and doing something that I had to do to me getting to a point where I I didn't want to go a day without reading the Bible. And I realized it was starting to soften my heart. It was starting to change me. Um, and, it, and it started to bring a newness of life in me. And it started to awaken uh, what I thought was completely dead. And so it was through God's word and through the kindness of God and through the Holy Spirit since that time that he has started to rebuild me. I will go back for just a moment to that time in South Africa. Uh, you know, I panicked. And one of the first things I did was apply for a different visa because someone had said that it 
could work. And that fell flat. We lost thousands of pounds. My husband had to sell the house that he'd first bought. Um, and we just plowed all of that money into trying to get me and the kids over. We lost so much money. We lost our pride. We lost everything. I had to go back with a begging bowl, begging for my job back, which I didn't get back. I had to beg for places for the kids for their schooling, which they did get back. But the teacher was not happy that she had to have these extra kids in the classroom. It was an inconvenience for her. Um, and so it was a very hard time. But God showed me this picture at that time where I was just so heartbroken. And he showed me a picture of me walking through a dark tunnel. And all I could see was this blackness. I knew I was in a black, dark tunnel. And right at the end of this tunnel, I saw a light, just a speck. And so I had to start walking towards this light. And as I started walking, I almost tripped over something that was on the, on the ground. And as I bent down, there was a real stench and I kind of belted back. And I went back down to see and it was a woman lying on the floor. And she must have been there for I don't know how long. But the smell of her was repulsive. But I, I was compelled to ask her if she was okay because I didn't know if you know, if she's dead or uh, what she was doing down there. And I just knew that she, I needed to ask if she helped, if I could help her. And she, she let me help her. When I got over the kind of smell, I helped her up. And I said, look, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And shall we, you know, let's walk towards it. And so we slowly but surely, we started walking towards this light, the two of us. And as my eyes began to adjust to the light, I started seeing more and more people in this tunnel. Some of them had just gotten so used to living there. Some of them were hanging up washing. Some of them were cooking. Some of them were just sitting and staring with glazed eyes. And I kept asking those who were on the sides of this tunnel, join us. The light is up front. Come along. Come with us. We're going towards the light. And then the picture kind of fast forwarded and I saw myself stepping out into the sunlight. And there was this little English, quintessentially English cottage. Um, and I just, and there was a beautiful, like an apple tree in, in the garden. And I just stood and felt the sun on my face. And it was as if the Lord promised me, I will get through this. And when I get through this, this journey through one of the darkest times in my life will not be in vain. That God would use it to speak to others of his kindness, of his relentless love, his great grace, and his mercy on us. That his voice spoke loud to me, and it's what's changed me forever. Um, and then just fast forward to Lent this year. Um, you know, I, uh, last year, at the start of um, 2020, I was actually looking back in my journals and I, I saw that in uh, the end of 2019, God had given me, uh, I journaled on and off. Um, and in December 9, 2019, God had given me a promise that he was going to give me a gift in 2020 and I must accept it. And I didn't really think anything of it. I just was writing. I, you know, I learned how to journal when I was a young girl. I would write a letter to God and then I would imagine what God would write back to me as his child, as his daughter, as his beloved. And based on his word, I would just write whatever came to mind. And it was kind of just based on the Bible, just 
flooding out just spontaneously. And then occasionally I would catch something that sounded like it it kind of jumped out and it was fresh and new. And, and I would think that that really sounds like something that's from God. It can it's confirmed in God's word. Uh, and and then in early 2020, I was looking back at my journals and I'd written in there as well that God said he's going to give me a gift and I need to accept it. And then in the run-up to Lent 2020, like most radio presenters do, I said to the listeners, so what are you going to give up for Lent this year? And I said, well, it'll for me, it'll probably be chocolate and alcohol or something like that and then I went to a song and as the song started I just had the sense that I must give up a Netflix and I was in the middle of a series that I really liked so I knew this was God but now I'd already been on this journey over the last three or four years of surrender and obedience learning 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 to surrender my will, to surrender my will, to surrender my will, to obey instantly. And so I knew I had to do this. So I gave up Netflix for Lent. But I also felt at the start of Lent that God wanted to give me something. And so he wanted me to journal. So I started writing at the start of Lent. And I wrote what has now become God Speaks. 40 letters from the Father's heart. These 200 word letters based on God's word filled with love from the Father's heart. Uh, just word, really beautiful, beautiful. Something that I, and within days, it felt that I, I sensed that God said, This is going to be for more than just you. It's going to be a book and it's going to be for more than just you. And I kind of just shelved that idea. And then um, after Lent, around about May time, we were planning on going out as a family. And God said, you need to send that. What I gave you during Lent, send it now before you go out with your family to a publisher. And so I found a publisher who accept un unsolicited work. Um, and they liked it. And when God said that this is going to be a book, I could really envision it as being something beautiful because what he gave me was beautiful. It was like nothing I'd read, like nothing I'd written before. It was, I knew that it was from the Father's heart. This was from God. And so I wanted it to be a hardcover gift book, something that would be treasured for forever. And when I spoke to the publishers, that's exactly what they said. I just started weeping because it felt like the Lord had and he is continuing to transform me, that I am new. And it's only by his grace and his kindness that he's helped me through years and years and years of rebellion and of striving with God, of wrestling with God that he's helped me by his spirit. He's, he knows my heart. And through all of this, he's known my heart. He's known that there will come a day when Ruth will turn. <laughs> her will over to me. Surrender her will. And when I did, just the joy that he's given me in serving him. And now it's with such a willing heart. Uh, I just love Jesus. And I know... The same is for you. You know, maybe you have also wrestled with God uh, in one form or another, in one way or another. And you just think, you know, there's one particular area of my life where I just feel like I don't know that I can have true freedom in this area. Um, I just feel like it's, it's a place where I just have a constant battle. And... So I want to just encourage you to, um, to pray. I'm going to pray for you that tonight you will know that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. God is so kind. He's patient. He doesn't want you or me or anybody to be lost without him. Jesus said that he came to give us life and life in abundance. 
all of those years of rebellion proved to me that life without God leaves me unfulfilled, leaves me unsatisfied. It leaves us lacking and wanting more. Uh, you know, at the end of Lent, I try to go back to that program and I'd lost my taste for it. Just didn't do it for me anymore. Because through all of those days of Lent and a few days afterwards as well, writing those letters from God had fed my soul. So I want to pray with you right now. Maybe you have wrestled with God all of your life and tonight you feel like this is it. I want to, I want that. I want what you've got, Ruth. I want to come into alignment with God's word. I want to line up with what God says about me, about my identity. I want to believe God's word over my life. God is speaking to you tonight. And so will you pray with me to completely surrender your life to Jesus? Not just part of it. He wants all of you. He has wooed you and you are here today for a reason. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love me. God, thank you that you've made a way for me to know you, for me to hear you speak over my life. Through Jesus Christ, your son. Your word says that if I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ, you are the son of God, that you died and rose again, that I will be saved. And so tonight... I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ, you are the Son of God, the only way for me to know you, God. I accept you and receive you as my Lord and Savior. I want to serve you for the rest of my days. I'm all in, God. I want to serve you completely. I surrender all. I come into line with your word of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and teach me, help me, lead me. Help me to do your will. Help me to follow you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, Ruth, for sharing such a wonderful story. And thank you for the way you finished with that wonderful prayer. Please, if you prayed that prayer with Ruth tonight, let us know by contacting us on our hotline, which is 07943-550-287. Or if you're outside the UK, then put plus four four in front of that number. You can phone, WhatsApp, or text, and someone will get back to you as soon as possible. Or you can also go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com, and you can put a message on there. And also you can click on the app which tells you, how can I know God? How can I know God? You can also get a Bible app, a Gideon's a Bible app, which will help you, as Ruth said tonight, by reading the Word of God, your life can be completely transformed. And I thank you, Ruth, for sharing tonight that it's not all plain sailing. It's not all easy when you come to Jesus, that we do have challenges. It doesn't mean that nothing will go ever, ever go wrong, but we've got someone there who can help in every situation. And let me encourage you to uh, get hold of Ruth's book, uh, Messages from, what's it called again, Ruth? God Speaks. God Speaks. 40 Letters from the Father's Heart. God speaks 40 letters from the Father's heart. And the, the official launch is this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. And you can follow that on uh, Ruth's website, which is ruthoreillysmith.com. And how can people get hold of that book, Ruth? 
Yeah, they can get it from there as well. So if you just go on to the website, ruthoreillysmith.com and just click on the God Speaks tab, you can get a hold of the book. You can join us for the online event, which is on Wednesday at half past seven. You can read more God Speaks letters that are not in the book at the moment because the Lord kept giving them to me after Lent, which is very kind of him. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Alan. Oh, bless you, Ruth. I'm going to hand over to George now. I think he has some questions for you. Thanks, George. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Ruth, for such a wonderful story. I mean, as Alan said, it wasn't all plain sailing. Now, you normally work on radio, so let me make you feel at home, okay? Here we go. Let me just make you feel at home. Here, God. <laughs> Have you got a pair as well? <laughs> Champion. <laughs> 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 so, now, you, you said, that obviously, you come from South Africa. I, I've got one of those as well. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, what do you believe? <laughs> Um, born in South Africa with a lo loving family, uh, but you may not know, but statistically they say there's 110 million people worldwide who claim Irish ancestry. Are you one of those with a name like O'Reilly? Definitely. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> Love my Irish heritage. It's from my, my father's side. He's the O'Reilly. Amen. Now, you, you mentioned your brothers and sisters as well, and you came through a loving family and came to faith. Um, have your brothers and sisters also come through and gone on in the faith? Most of them have. I'm still believing for my sister, Mary. You can pray for her. You will. <laughs> um, that her and her family would come to know Christ. Uh, the Lord gave me a beautiful picture of her, actually, recently, and I did share that with her. God gave me a dream of her. Um, it, it looked like an autumn season and Jesus walking with her in the autumn. And so I just had that sense that in the autumn of her life, she would walk with Jesus again. And I'm believing for that. Amen. Now, you said you came up with a loving family, learned about the Bible and went to church and everything like that. I just want to read one comment that we got here, Okay. It says, I can't believe you compared yourself with Jacob. You have the voice of an angel. I love hearing you on UCB too. Your voice is so calming and therapeutic. If you swore at me, I wouldn't take offense because of your voice. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm pleased God has cleansed you from using French. <laughs> now, the question I have on that particular comment is, how did a good girl like yourself ever learn to speak French? Mm. Well, I had, uh, I actually had an Italian friend and she taught me all the swear words in Italian. Oh. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I have to be very careful when I think about Italian. I mean, I love Italy, uh, but really, I just try and stick to the ciao. I was quite deliberate, actually, in searching out for, look, if you, if you're in, if you're in school, uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't take you long to pick up some some words that you think I, true? I could probably <laughs> use to fit in. <laughs> did you, to, to, mentioning school, did you learn some when you were teaching as well? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I, I did. Just reflecting, because Alan, Alan was a teacher as well. Now, you, as you say, you grew up in a loving family. You learned all about the Bible and everything. But why do you think it took you so long? To read the whole Bible? Great question. I think that um, it just, it felt like it was too much for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just, it felt like it was too big, too mm -hmm. big a book and, and just too overwhelming. I, I was never really taught how to read it. Mm -hmm. From cover to cover and and I was I guess I was never taught that that was possible that it was good you know um I suppose the um the general kind of consensus when anybody spoke about books like Numbers and Leviticus was you know the way that people would even say those books of the Bible would be with almost disdain or just horror or you know such almost negativity that I guess it just fed into that 
sense that it was going to be just too overwhelming. I wouldn't mm. understand it. I, I didn't even want to make an effort um, to get into it. But that's the wonderful thing about God's word is that uh, I have found, and I mean, there are wonderful, um, you know, kind of chronological ways mm -hmm. of reading the Bible these days through apps and so on. But, um, and I've not actually done that yet. I, I would like to do that. But what I've been doing is just kind of reading it through um, from, from the beginning to the end. At the moment, my kind of, the, the way that I um, read the Bible at the moment is one Old Testament chapter and one new testament chapter so uh, at the moment i'm in isaiah okay. and in revelation tough uh, books very tough books yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> you pick the easy ones there mine's <laughs> holy spirit for wisdom uh, before <laughs> i read now you mentioned of course as well you made a commitment at five and then you had the uh, the yes or no moment at 13 how important do you think it is then that we should also teach children the gospel Oh, huge, uh, massive. I'll tell you a story about my children. Uh, and mm. my prayer is really that they will come to know Jesus for themselves. But at the, at the moment, they're young enough for us to enforce church and Bible yeah. reading and prayer on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lovingly and with much grace. So You're going to church and that's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you will go to church. Yeah, church. So there's no PS4. <laughs> so you choose, you know. Yeah. Um, we can kind of do that still. Uh, but, but my prayer is that the good seed sown in their hearts will one day bring forth good fruit in season. Um, but going back to the start of 2020, um, I have for years given the children a devotional book for them to, to study, to do just a short little devotional in the morning before they have breakfast. So just a short time for them to connect with God, give their day to God. Um, and this was kind of the only way that I knew how is just buy them like a little teen devotional or when they were younger, um, one that was kind of age specific to them. So they were getting to the habit of connecting with God in the morning before they head out to school. Um, but I think it might have been towards the end of 2019 that I had Precept Ministries, um, uh, Precept UK on my show as an interview. Oh, I think I spoke to the founder of Precept UK, uh, um, Precept Ministries, and she sent me a couple of books for the children which were the names of God from Precept Ministries. And so I gave that to Samuel and Caitlin. So for the first time ever, um, the, the children were doing something completely different. And it was just, it, it only lasted for about, I think, two months or so. I forget now, but it wasn't for a very long time. But they went through one of the names of God every day as part of their devotional time with the Lord in the morning. And then after that, I didn't know what to do. So <laughs> we'd kind of come to, I think it was probably around February, and I just think, you know, do I need to get another devotional for my children or what do I do now? And I felt like the Lord said, let them just read the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, they're old enough. Uh, mm -hmm. They were 13 at the time. And so I, I challenged them and I said, why don't you read a book of the Bible? Read a chapter every day. and then." write down something that stands out to you from what you've read. Um, what have you learned about God? What have you learned about yourself? What have you learned that you can apply to your life? Just three short things. Um, and so they started doing that. And, you know, ever since, <laughs> they have now read through, I don't know how many books in the Bible, they keep coming to me saying, I'm finished with one Timothy, Mom, what shall I read now? And I've been trying to, help them go from New Testament to Old Testament. So, um, you know, sometimes we underestimate children. Yeah. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I don't know that this is going to really work for them. But especially when they're young, let's just, you know, the Holy Spirit is for, for, for our children and it's for adults. And um, we really try um, 
and just instill biblical values in our children and wherever we can. And I think the big thing that my husband and I feel quite passionately about is just being honest as well. So there are loads of times where I mess up as a mother or, you know, just as a human being. And I, I feel like it's really helpful for me to say to them then in those moments, you know, I'm sorry, I was wrong. This is not good. It's not the Christ-like way. Um, please forgive me. And kids are just amazing. I mean, I, they do. Yeah. They're just very forgiving. So I, I believe really passionately yeah, in us telling our children about Christ. It's our responsibility. We have to. Yeah. And as a radio presenter on a Christian radio station, you're in, in everybody's view, so to speak, or earshot, uh, how difficult is it then for you to be a role model to your kids and to other people? being in the public eye as a Christian? I guess I really did feel the pressure when, uh, when I was struggling in my walk with God, mm -hmm. when I wasn't fully surrendered. Uh, because you know in your heart that you're not 100% right with Christ. And there's this uh, the enemy will bring in condemnation quite a lot. And so I lived for years feeling condemned, knowing that I wasn't living the way I wanted to live in Christ. I wasn't living fully surrendered. And that was hard. And that is difficult. It ends up becoming quite a striving thing. Um, you know, where you're trying to, and it's almost as if it feels like you're putting a mask on, you know, and then every now and then the mask drops. You feel exposed and you kind of then you're filled with shame and guilt. And then I've got to go, I'm sorry, I stuffed up again. You know, please forgive me. Um, but I just feel free. I feel so free now. Um, yeah. I am who I am and, and I just love the, I'm a new creation. The old is past. And I thank God for his grace on my life. So I feel very free now. Amen. And how often have the kids come to you? But, Mommy, you said. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. Many times. Yeah, we've all had it. I have no. to watch my, watch my words because they <laughs> remember. They remember better they than do. I remember. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you were, you were in South Africa, you grew up, you went to university, you, you worked in a couple of radio stations, and you came to the UK. And you said you applied to the BBC, but you didn't get the job. I know why you didn't get the job. Because you don't have a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you ever considered television presenting? Oh, TV is another animal. You know, on UCB, I do get to do the occasional um, UCB. You still have TV. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very expensive and uh, we, we've we had to pull back from a lot of those other things that we were doing to really focus on radio, which we felt um, was what God primarily called um, UCB to that along with the word for today. And so I have had the moments because I am a staff member and part of my responsibility is being part of the team. Mm -hmm. And so I have on occasion been asked to, I've been hauled in front of the camera to do work in front of the camera, but it's tough. Um, <laughs> I remember Samuel Ball, who's one of my, uh, one of my uh, peers and colleagues, the two of us were asked to do a little advert for the expansion of DAB across England. Really and we did retake after retake after retake after retake. Um, and so, yeah, it was just painful to try and get this very short, it was probably about a minute advert, the two of us. We just kept forgetting our script. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, it's uh, the great thing about radio is that, and my daughter thinks it's really boring, because I'm in a studio on my own with a microphone for four hours. I mean, on my own in a glass box. She could just can't see how that could be interesting at all. But I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Um, 
sure, you know, I'd be open to whatever, whatever God leads me to. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I must admit, I'm a big fan of radio myself, and I like you. I, I used to listen to little uh, radio stations from around the world as well. And uh, I worked in radio for, for quite a number of years as well. Um, but speaking of UCB and, and uh, speaking to guests, okay, have you ever had a guest on your show and you thought after two minutes, oh, I don't really want to talk to this fellow or this person? <laughs> yeah, I have. And that's Was that Alan by any chance? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, Alan was amazing. Uh, his interview is on my, on my UCB webpage, by the way. Excellent. Um, yeah, I have, and that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I often say, and people think I'm joking, or they just think I'm being super spiritual, but it really is true that God is the producer on that show, mm -hmm. the overall producer. I have um, a couple of colleagues who help me to uh, book the guests, the Lord brings people. I pray a lot that the right people will get in touch with the show. I don't have a huge amount of time to do loads of research and, you know, checks on people. So I, I really rely on the Holy Spirit heavily. And a lot of times if, if I feel a little unsure about somebody, I'll suggest a pre-record. Did we do that, Alan? With you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, rather than going live. And yeah. so there, there have, there was one occasion where I will, I will tell you one uh, where I recorded a testimony. It's a testimony of someone who spoke of a healing, and then when I was trying to get back to them for some of the, the, the kind of more details, it turned out that they'd lied um, in some of the retelling of their story. And so in the end, that testimony never made it to air. But I just thank God that he protected me mm. and UCB and the listeners yeah. um, by, you know, helping me to do a pre-recorded program. And that actually I just, he gave me this sense that I needed to just wait and hold off. And eventually it, the truth came to light, you know, so I just thank Excellent. God. He, he's a cover really for the, the program. And how much freedom do you actually have on UCB to actually preach the gospel itself? Is oh, it loads. No. Loads. Loads, yeah. Um, so we can, we can pretty much just do whatever. And, and the great thing is that we get to pray for people as well. On our every at the moment, every Thursday from one o'clock, we have prayer breakthrough, and so we have a pastor um, or a, a leader in ministry praying live for people between one and two. I think that might change in the new year, the time of it, but we can keep it. Um, and so, yeah, we can we can share the gospel, and I love it when people like Alan come on the program and they. Um, pray and invite people into a walk with Jesus. It's, it's wonderful. We like to, as a radio station, you, UCB one is primarily uh, evangelistic in its content. So you will hear a real diversity of mm -hmm. music, Christian music, all Christian music by Christian artists, but a real different range, a varying range. Then on UCB two, it's primarily worship music. Um, and different kinds of worship in the evenings, especially from about seven o'clock, you have different styles. So you'll have your Southern gospel or you, you might have kind of a more up-tempo or more kind of chilled out um, dance worship type style. Dance worship, that was good, Alan. <laughs> more for the Christian, more, more for, the, um, more for the, the person who's been walking with God for a bit longer it's like a discipleship journey. and is, is there some kind of music policy as well whereby you vet certain music that you won't play certain oh, types sure, of music sure yeah. yeah I mean the quality of the music has to be really top notch it's got mm -hmm. to be exceptional I mean I think it's something that I'm very passionate about is that as Christians we cannot afford to be less than exceptional at mean. everything we do mm -hmm. we have to be excellent we have to, you know, we can't, 
if people look at us, I mean, the Bible is very clear about how people, you know, doesn't matter what people think of you and your relationship with God, but if they can look at your life and see your good works and glorify God, then that's a bonus. Um, so I think, you know, we as Christians have to be excellent, mm -hmm. not to please people, but it's for the, the smile of heaven. Amen. Over us. Now you're a full-time mom, full-time worker, full-time wife. How did you manage to find time to write this book? Well, it was easy because it was in my time with God in the mornings. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what made it easy. Uh, I mean, I've had to carve out time to, to look through it and edit it. And, you know, I've had a lot of help with um, the, the publishing from Authentic Media. They've been amazing. So I just thank God for that. I couldn't have done it. You know, it took a long time for me to really, again, surrender <laughs> um, to God's will mm -hmm. for me to do this. It took, um, from the, the moment that I said yes, uh, that I was offered the contract, to me actually signing it and submitting it, it took four months of toing and froing. Mm -hmm. I didn't just sign it because I knew the cost. Mm -hmm. I knew the cost. So not just financially, I've had to buy a lot of equipment. I've had to pay someone to set up a website for me. Um, I've had to buy copies. I now know what 500 copies of books look like. <laughs> Boxes of books right here <laughs> next to me <laughs> in, the, in the office. Um, but also the cost in terms of time. Yeah. You know, and my number one priority after God is my husband and my children. And I don't, I didn't want anything to take me away from that. As you say, I've got a full-time job as well. And, and I have to respect and honor the position that God has placed me in at UCB too. Um, but I really believe that when we walk with Christ and we're obedient to him, he enlarges our capacity. And so, you know, the things that I'm able to do today I remember years ago thinking there is no way that I would have capacity to do that. I think of um, even on my show, on my radio show, interviewing two live guests most days would put the fear of God into me quite literally about yeah. three years ago. I mean, I remember when I was begging the woman who was working with me to book some pre-recorded interviews or to give me some space so that I didn't have to interview somebody every single day. Whereas now it's a joy. It's easy. Excellent. I love it. I <laughs> so quite like talking like, to people as well. <laughs> yeah, God, God, God extends your capacity. And, you know, if you're in his will, he makes a way. Now, just getting back to your story, you mentioned about, you know, the um, you compared yourself to David as well, okay? You thought you said a little bit of David. So uh, when you told your story about the um, coming back from South Africa the second time with the kids and that, for me, I read that as like, like a Goliath moment for you, how it, it was all there before you. Why do you think God allowed all this to happen to you in that particular moment? I, I, I think that, um, you know, it's this, this thread of, surrender and obedience that's run through my life. The, the importance for me to learn for myself mm -hmm. um, that I can trust God, that he is faithful, even when I lose everything that I hold dear, mm -hmm. and that my source would not be in my possession. You know, as someone who... The, the fact of the matter is that I, I was well respected in the community. People knew me. Um, you know, I was very involved with the youth before I went to England. And so when I got back, I was back into that community. And, um, and then I was involved with the local Christian radio station. Again, I was part of the talent scouting. I was, you know, finding people and training them up. I was very well respected. And so I look 
at that as an opportunity for um, the Lord to just um, bring me to a place where I, I realized my need for him alone, that I could trust him alone and that he was faithful even in my in my most broken moments you know and that it wasn't about me and the reliance on uh, my name and my position and all that I had worked for um, and the respect and the honor that I had in in the community and the standing that I had and how people perceived me that it was it was about God um, yeah. first and foremost Second last question, you mentioned about hearing from God, apart from reading your book, of course, how can people hear from God today, do you think? Well, the word is always the most reliable. Uh, that's the safest place. And, mm. you know, but don't just read the Bible. Uh, before, I always say, this is how, you know, I started to really enjoy reading the Bible, is by asking the Holy Spirit to teach me. So I would just say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Before I read this, I'm about to read your word. Help me to understand it. Help me to see something in here mm -hmm. of who God is, the nature of God, of who I am in light of who you are. Um, and then ask God to show you, where do I even begin? You know, mm -hmm. um, Lead me to the right place you want me to start. And so I would say God's word. Just be honest with God and ask him to speak to you. Amen. And ask him to help you to be still. You've got to be still. I mean, the Bible says, exactly. Psalm 46, verse 10. It's very, hard. It's very hard to do. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> very be still. I, I find you're right. You're spot on. And I mean, you know, different people hear God in different ways. I love going for walks. So after my show, I'll go for a walk to the alpacas down the road at UCB and I'll just offload. Um, I'll mm -hmm. speak to God and then I'll just be still and I'll look at creation and I'll look at the birds and, you know, and then maybe a thought pops into my head and maybe I'm just reminded of somebody and I'll start praying for them. Um, and so in, I think what it is is really just recognizing that that is God speaking to me. That's one of the ways that God is speaking to me. Excellent. Well, you've made a lot of decisions in your life. Some forced on you, some not. But of all the decisions you have made, what was the best decision you have ever made? Definitely surrendering to Jesus, Amen. to his will, surrendering to God. Uh, and then I guess marrying my husband, that would be a close second. <laughs> He's a good guy. Uh, I meant to ask you about your husband. You said when he when, when, when he was going on, you were coming back from the UK, he lost his job. How is he doing now, your husband? He's doing good. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah, that was a tough time for him as well. Very difficult. He's the kind of guy who's a fix-it man. Um, so when there's a problem, he wants to solve it. Uh, he's just like a hero when it comes to problems. He loves problems. He loves, he's a problem solver. <laughs> Um, but this was a problem he couldn't solve. And yeah. even though he wrote to our local MP, I mean, it just didn't make sense on so many levels, just the perceived injustice. But the reality is that I'd made a mistake. You know, I'd, I'd not looked at some of the, the specifications on that particular visa. So there was nothing that could be done. And so it was for him to learn as well. Amen. Surrender and trust God. Well, Tell him thanks for your time tonight, of course, for coming on here. And it's been fantastic speaking with you. And hopefully we will speak again uh, uh, soon. So with that, Alan, I'll hand back to you, brother. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you, George. And thank you, Ruth, again. It's been absolutely wonderful. I've really enjoyed hearing you share tonight and just enjoyed being with you on your program, too. It was just a, a blessing to be in your company, in your fellowship, in fellowship with you. Thank you for sharing so wonderfully tonight your life story. Please tonight, if you have been blessed by Ruth's story or you pray that prayer with her tonight, or you need help in any way, contact us on our hotline 07943 or if you're outside the UK, put plus 44 in front of that number. 
You can phone, WhatsApp or text and someone will get back to you as soon as possible. And you can also go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com and you'll find there, how can I know God? You can find out more about that. You can find a Bible app, a Gideon's Bible app, which will help you. As we said tonight, reading the word, that's how God can speak to you. So please do that. Get a hold of that Bible. And uh, also, remind, I must remind you, on Wednesday is the launch of uh, Ruth's book. Um, God speaks 40 letters from the Father's heart. Please contact her. On, there's the book. She's showing you it right now. And you can go to uh, RuthO'ReillySmith.com, and that's how you can get hold of her book. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Howard. Thank you all for joining us tonight. But let me remind you that we'll have another story next week. Like Ruth, I, I, I asked God, who does he want to share on these programs? And he's been faithful. Since March 2020, we've had a speaker every Monday evening. And we have some wonderful stories. And we will be back again next Monday at 8 o'clock. The guest speaker next week is a man called Ken Clapham. Ken was brought up in the Toxteth area of Liverpool in a working class family. And he heard God speak to him when he was only seven years old, playing football in the street. He heard God speak to him, telling me one day he was going to be a preacher. And other times God spoke to him. It follows on, really, from what Ruth shared tonight. Uh, so please join us next week uh, at 8 o'clock on Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube live. Also, during the week at 12 o'clock every day, apart from Saturday, you can go on to YouTube again, Life Stories uh, at Lunch. And there you will find some of the stories are repeated, parts of stories repeated. You can also go to uh, the Monday Night Zoom and you can catch up with all the stories that we've had over these past, well, more than 12 months now. And you're getting on for a year and a half now. And you'll be able to catch up and hear Ruth's story again on there. That will be repeated. And again, tell other people about these stories. But thank you again for joining us tonight. May God bless you. May you have a wonderful week. May you know his joy, you know his peace. And God bless you all.